Okay. We are almost almost ready for the last session and we are really happy, proud to have you here, Professor Richard Sambrook. Richard he is a professor of journalism and director of the Center for Journalism at Cardiff University. He spent three decades with the BBC, both as a producer and as a news reporter. So his experience is quite vast. He has been publishing quite a lot. I was reading the list, quite impressive. And I think for this conference, uh, perhaps the most relevant ones are the one you published in 2016 on Panama Papers, the nuts and bolts for massive international investigation. And perhaps also I would like to focus on global teamwork, the rise of collabor collaboration in investigative journalism that was published by Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism last year. So welcome to us, Richard. Thank you very much, Roy. Thank you, and good afternoon, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here, and um, I shall do my utmost to keep you awake for the next half hour at least. I know it's that point in the afternoon. Uh, we've also got a lot of problems to solve. There are millions of fraudulent uh, people we've got to track down. Um, we've got the asymmetry in information that um, Joe uh, Stieglitz spoke about this morning. We need to resolve that one. Uh, we've got um, the whole hollowing out of news organizations thanks to the uh, collapse of the economic model. Um, we've got the risks, the physical risks to journalists all around the world. So I will solve as many as I can, but I, I only have about uh, 28 minutes now. So we'll see how we go. Uh, a little bit more about me so you know uh, who's talking at you. So yes, I was at the BBC for 30 years as a uh, producer, a field producer, program editor, and then I was uh, head of news, director of news uh, and of the World Service for a decade. So the World Service in 45 countries, 45 different languages, about 300 million people listening to it every week. I'm now Professor of Journalism at Cardiff University, which is um, the biggest journalism school in the UK. I do quite a lot of work with the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism in Oxford, uh, which is a sort of uh, media think tank, journalism think tank, uh, where I'm a research associate. I'm on the board of the Bureau of Investigative Journalism. If you don't know about that, it's a very, it's a quite a small and less well-funded British version of ProPublica, basically. If anybody wants to help solve our funding issues, I'd be delighted to talk to you afterwards. Um, and uh, as Roy was saying, I do publish some stuff, and I'm going to talk particularly about global teamwork, um, the, uh, the publication that he mentioned there, because that's the most relevant one. And that basically was something that about two years ago, with colleagues from the Reuters Institute, we started to look at why was there an increase in collaboration uh, an unusual increase in collaboration uh, off the back of the Panama Papers. Uh, why was it happening and, and what were the, um, the qualities, what were the things that made it work? Uh, and we had a big workshop with a lot of those involved in the Panama Papers and other collaborations at the time, the football files, the migrant files, and so on as well. Uh, uh, a big full day workshop, a whole number of interviews, uh, surveys, uh, and then this edited volume came out with a lot of contributions from those who were there. And out of that, we tried to distill some of the success factors behind uh, collaborations and uh, some of the reasons why it's happening. So I suppose it, that, that's the place to start. And we've touched on a lot of these themes today already, um, but the environment for collaboration is, um, is new to a large extent. Of course, news agendas are now global, more global perhaps than they've ever been. Whether you're looking at security, whether you're looking at climate change, <coughs> whether you're looking at trade and economics, capital flows, and of course crime, all of these are big international global stories, and you can't really get to grips with them unless you take in the global dimension. Um, so newsrooms have got to be able to break out from their traditional geographical boundaries. But of course, for a lot of news organizations at the moment, that's very difficult to do. Um, they, they are short of money. Uh, their commercial model has been undermined. Uh, newsrooms have been hollowed out. Um, digital tools have delivered enormous benefits to reporting and to distribution, uh, and particularly around data and so on. But they have also devastated the economics of news and, as I said, hollowed out some of those institutions. Uh, and one of the things, as a, just as an aside here, I think, um, I don't know how many of you may have heard of what's sometimes called the Quartz Curve, because um, the founder of Quartz was someone who wrote about it. Um, 
But the idea is that now there is a U shape to news provision. And at w the top end of one of the U's is commoditized, breaking, immediate news uh, that we're all exposed to. It finds you on your phone, uh, it finds you in the street, it's online, it's everywhere around us. And some people try to play in that area around instant breaking news, uh, but it's quite hard to make money there. Uh, but that's a kind of open advertising model of news. At the other end of the U is niche, specialist, usually subscription, high-quality news, which people are prepared to pay for. Uh, and there isn't much market for news in the middle, but unfortunately in the middle was where a lot of newspapers and indeed broadcast newsrooms uh, uh, structured their provision. And that's why uh, a lot of people are struggling now to work out how to uh, make money and how to survive in a new environment. They're either going to go into a hyper-competitive, commoditized environment at one end, or they limit their audience and go deep and niche and specialist for a subscription. And the reason I'm mentioning this is it picks up on something that I think Joe Stiglitz said this morning. I, I worry that the result of that over time, and I think we're already seeing it, is going to be even greater information inequality, even greater asymmetry of information. In other words, if you have got money and you can pay for the information that you want, you will get fantastic high quality information, possibly more than you've ever been able to get before. But actually most people won't do that and they will be picking up what they can in this very noisy, often misleading uh, environment of that commoditized news. Um, so I think this uh, problem of, of asymmetry and in information provision is going to get worse before it gets better. Um, now, of course, collaboration is a response um, to a lot of these changes and to the globalization of news, and it strengthens journalism uh, And at a time when accountability reporting is, is perhaps more important than ever. Uh, and let me briefly just reflect on some of the other changes around journalism that have happened because of these pressures. So in the 20th century, uh, and I'm going to vastly generalize here, and I'm going to be talking about Western news but to a large extent, uh, but in the 20th century, journalists were largely white, male, uh, and, and probably middle class. Today, thankfully, a lot more diverse, though a lot further to go. In the past, they were usually on staff of large organizations with associated privileges. Today, there are more freelancers, more short-term contracts. It's a different way of working. In the past, the journalists largely worked independently. Today, they're much more likely to be part of a team, particularly in the digital uh, area. Uh, in the past, they worked to one or two deadlines, usually on a single medium. Today, they work on constant deadlines on multiple platforms. Uh, they were largely in the past competitive individuals seeking exclusivity. These days, social and collaborative skills are a premium. In the past, they were largely focused on revelation. Today, revelation still matters, but things like verification, interpretation, and analysis are being more highly prized. In the past, a journalist probably worked with a fairly limited group of uh, primary sources. Today, journalists have to be networked with access to literally hundreds of sources. In the past, they could work with little transparency or accountability. Today, the more open they are, the more accountable they are, the more trusted they are. Now, that's a vast generalization, but you can see that those trends, to a large extent, have happened or are in the process of happening. And that's a very different uh, environment in which to work as a journalist. To be open, to be accountable, to be networked, to have a premium on collaborative skills and social skills, working to multiple deadlines, usually across multiple media, it's an entirely different kind of journalistic environment. So I mention that because I think this is quite an important aspect to why collaboration has started to take off. Now we've talked uh, uh, already today about um, uh, the risks and dangers around um, journalism. This was Times Person of the Year uh, last year, basically dead journalists. Um, there was Jamal Khashoggi, obviously, on the left. Uh, on the right, there is the staff from the Capital Gazette, the US newspaper where five people were killed uh, by a gunman. I think there are a number of other um, uh, covers as well. Uh, but murder and intimidation is rising. Roughly over the last 20 years, on average, two journalists have been killed every week, week in, week out, doing their work. Uh, actually, the trend is tilting up a little bit at the moment. <clears throat> in 2018, out of the 53 deaths, 34, according to the CPJ, were re retaliatory. In other words, people being murdered because of the reporting that they were doing. 
And 97% of uh, reporters in jail are local reporters, usually those who've been working on crime and corruption in some way. And according to Transparency International, 368 journalists killed between 2012 and 2017. One in five of them was investigating corruption. And the countries with the lowest protection uh, for the press and for NGOs, as we know, have the highest levels of corruption. And I think that brings me to one of the other themes that I want to pick up from today. And one of the things we might discuss a little bit if there's time at the end is this question of, you know, what is the purpose of it? What is the impact of it? And we've talked about it's about getting policy change um, or, you know, for funders, there may be uh, uh, other measures of success. Um, but I think one of the problems is that although we in this room might all agree that free and open journalism is a social good, the evidence for it is very hard to point to. And when you try to engage governments or you try to engage other agencies, finding the evidence that says, you know, if you provide more protection for a free press, if you provide more protection, uh, uh, if you deal with impunity for those who threaten the press, then politically, economically and socially your country will benefit, it's very hard to make that argument with any concrete evidence at all. And I think that's one of the uh, issues that we can add to the list of things that we've got to try to solve. Um, <clears throat> so, while there is at least some progress towards um, uh, freedom to information, this is uh, uh, an infographic from Article 19, the Global Free Speech NGO. And actually the headlines here are not bad. 90% of the world's population uh, lives in a country with a, a, an RTI law or policy. 75 countries have joined the Open Government Partnership with a commitment to opening up data. Um, you can see the other statistics there. There is a headline picture there, and it's driven largely by the Sustainable Development Goals, where this has been made a, a priority and a focus from the UN. Uh, a headline there that's quite optimistic. But I think most of us know that underneath that, that headline, underneath that crust, actually things are not quite as rosy as they appear. Um, we know that commitment is weak in many countries. So even those in the Open Government Partnership, a lot of them are paying lip service to open data and they're not actually providing it or they're providing it in a way that's almost impossible to analyse um, or you know, there are other problems with what they're doing. So it's, lip service is one thing, delivering is something else. We know that press freedom protections are weak in many uh, parts of the world. Um, we, knew, we know that there's misuse of privacy legislation, misuse of terrorism legislation in order to um, uh, try to intimidate journalists or to try to um, uh, uh, prevent uh, uh, some journalism. Um, FOI laws also exclude the private sector, yet increasingly in many countries the private sector is performing functions uh, pre previously performed in the public sector. So you know, there's a big loophole there that uh, is not yet being caught. We know that we live in a surveillance state, and certainly uh, uh, for those who know anybody who's involved in the Snowden investigations, for example, the kind of surveillance and anti-surveillance um, uh, measures that those involved in that story had to take were really considerable and really quite complicated. Uh, and just to pick up on the conversation here, one of the difficulties we have as well is defining the public interest. And, you know, academics and professors like me can give you a definition of the public interest. Some lawyers will come up with a definition of the public interest. In British law, there is no really hard to find definition of the public interest. And that's true in many other countries as well. So as journalists, we can say we can justify a lot of our actions because it's in the public interest. But of course, in a lot of countries, they wouldn't recognize that. They wouldn't accept that. There's no uh, a, a broadly accepted definition of what that means. So underneath this, this sort of headline that actually says things are moving in the right direction in terms of access to information, open data and so on, we know there are still a lot of very difficult and knotty issues that we're having to deal with. And of course as well, the political hostility to journalism driven from Trump and others and the consequent risk of self-censorship, both of which you talked about. So uh, this book that I did, it's only there because I couldn't find a different picture to put up. I'm not trying to promote it, though. If you want it, it's a free download from the Reuters Institute site. Um, we tried to look at you know, what was happening and, and what were the success measures. Um, and I think the point was that collaboration is able to mitigate, not all, but some of those problems. So for those newsrooms that have been hollowed out, you're able to pool resources and, and particularly pool expertise. 
So one news partner may well have uh, you know, a specialist journalist in one particular area, and another partner may have a technologist who's particularly good at data wrangling around a particular area. Neither of those organizations has exactly what they need to deal with a particular leak, but together they can. They can pool resources, they can pool expertise. That's an obvious one. Uh, another advantage is institutional strength. So if you're the New York Times or the BBC or Reuters, uh, it's okay, because if somebody comes at you with their lawyers, you can probably muster up the lawyers to, uh, to fight them off or to do whatever you need to do. If you're a small digital startup or you're a non-profit, if you're the ICIJ or Bureau of Investigative Journalism or whatever else, and someone comes at you with lawyers, you've got a really big problem, let alone if you're a freelance journalist on their own. But networking in with big organizations, of course, gives you an institutional strength that you wouldn't otherwise have. So collaboration certainly helps with that in terms of in, you know, fighting off intimidation or being able to resist intimidation. Um, there are other legal uh, uh, advantages as well. There's um, legal arbitrage, as it were. So you can use the laws in one country uh, uh, in order to avoid legal risks in another. So, for example, The Guardian, again over Snowden, made sure it kept its files in New York where they had some First Amendment protection that they wouldn't have had in the UK. Uh, and, um, you know, countries at the moment haven't really managed to catch up with how people are able to use jurisdictions in that way in order to play them off against each other and to protect themselves. So there's legal arbitrage in that sense. There's also the question that actually, in terms of those people who do want to intimidate journalists if they're going uh, after a controversial investigation, if you know that even if you intimidate that journalist in that country, let alone if you were to kill them, it's going to appear over there in that country, or and in that country, and in that country, then actually suddenly the stakes are raised and it's probably not worth the risk or the effort. So there's a protection again in being networked in that way in terms of the pure physical intimidation and risk. Some of the success factors, I'll, I'll, I'll run through, there's just four or five headline ones from there. So obviously... When we looked at a whole range of uh, collaborative projects, Panama Papers and the Paradise Papers primarily, but also a number of others throughout Europe, and these were primarily Europe and American, we didn't, we didn't go uh, beyond that for this. Um, some of the sort of big headlines that struck out were obviously how do you build trust and how do you maintain confidentiality amongst different partners. So uh, on the Panama Papers, for example, there were something like, someone here will know the exact figure, 400 journalists who had access to some part of that material for a year and it didn't leak. So how was that achieved? Well, it's about building the relationship. Actually, in some of these cases, there are NDAs or there are contracts, but in the end, it's about a handshake. And in the end, it's about building a relationship. As somebody said, you cannot codify relationships. And that's why you have a number of little groups of news organizations who routinely and frequently work together. Uh, because they've built up the relationship and they've built up the trust. So trust building and confidentiality and putting investment into face-to-face -face understanding of each other makes a big difference to making it work. And in the end, if you trust someone, confidentiality can hold. Uh, success measures, agreeing success measures with funders. We've already touched on that, particularly if it's uh, an NGO uh, or if it's the Gates Foundation. Their success measure may be about you know, awareness of health issues or progress on a health issue. It's not going to be about transparency for transparency's sake. It's not going to be about free speech for free speech's sake. The media is a tool for them to reach another end. So but real clarity with your funders and with your partners about what a success measure is. For most media organizations, it'll be engagement, users, readers, whatever you may want. It'll just be awareness of what you've broken and what you've got out into the open, how many people know about it. But for a lot of other partners, activist groups, um, foundations and so on as well, they'll have other success measures. And unless there's cl real clarity about what it is you're going to do and what it is you're going to deliver, then that can become a very difficult problem to manage as these collaborations, particularly the long ones, uh, stretch out. Uh, technology expertise, a huge issue. And actually, a lot of newsrooms simply don't have it. Uh, I did some work with the Open Government Partnership a year or two ago about journalists engaging with open data uh, uh, and how much they knew about what the Open Government Partnership did and how much they knew about the impact studies and the case studies and so on as well. And there was you know, a bit of awareness, but it was shocking how many journalists simply had no idea about how to do the very basics of data journalism. 
they, you know, in, when asked how they would like the data released, um, more of them said, oh, I'll have it as a PDF, please, and have it as a spreadsheet that they can actually manage. They simply didn't understand it. Now, that's the very basic level. Then when you get into encryption, you get into kind of communication channels that you have to have, it gets more and more complicated. So that technology expertise, which on the big um, uh, investigations is what the ICIJ really brought to the party, uh, is a really, really uh, important factor, and particularly in terms of maintaining anonymity and confidentiality. Uh, and, of course, the truth is, uh, that in many cases a whistleblower will have already compromised themselves by the time they've made the first contact with a journalist because they'll have used an open email, they'll have used their mobile phone, uh, they won't necessarily have used a fully encrypted or safe channel uh, to reach a journalist. Uh, so, you know, their, their lot may be set before it's even really got underway. So an understanding of te technology and expertise in that is a crucial part of these big collaborations. <coughs> and uh, finally having a neutral partner to coordinate and arbitrate. And again, that's in the big uh, uh, investigations, the role that the ICIJ played, but even in the smaller investigations, somebody who can arbitrate between the different partners. What's gonna be published when? You've got a morning newspaper, an evening newspaper, a weekend television program, or something else on radio. You know, what goes when? Who decides the deadlines? How do you manage that globally? And how do you manage the content globally? And how do you agree what the agenda is uh, is really quite complicated and you have to have a neutral partner somewhere, a neutral party to try and manage that. It's about project management, it's about news editing, it's about editorial coordination and planning and that has become a role which is absolutely crucial and if you don't have somebody with that range of skills to try and manage a big collaboration then it will probably collapse. So those are some of the big findings that we had out of looking at this um, but there are also different forms of collaboration that are emerging. Um, so uh, fact-checking initiatives like Comprova in Brazil, Verificado in Mexico have forced newsrooms to work together. Um, in the States, ProPublica and New York Times and AP collaborated when the White House uh, finally started to publish um, the uh, financial disclosures and declarations of its staff, but they did so in no way that was catalogued and in no way that was easily accessible. So it was like a fishing, individual fishing expedition every time you tried to find out what a White House staffer had declared. But by uh, uh, working together, all those three organizations managed to get some traction on the story that individually they would have really uh, struggled to manage. New kinds of collaboration. Um, let's just reflect on that briefly. The OECD did a survey of investigative journalists last year, not, uh, not a huge survey. Um, they concluded that it was a good thing, so that was, that was good and encouraging. Um, but you'll see here, just to reflect back on some of the things I've been talking about, uh, inadequate freedom of information legislation and the confidentiality of law enforcement proceedings were the biggest obstacles uh, next to kind of communication uh, that people felt got in the way of them reporting on corruption. So this, the legal framework that sits in any country is really one of the big deciding factors about how successfully you can work in this area. Um, whistleblowers are still uh, the, the first sources, biggest source of information for journalists reporting on corruption, but cooperation with journalists in other countries there underneath, and I think that's, that's fairly significant. I'm not sure you would have seen that five years ago in quite the same way. Um, we talk a lot about leaks. It's all about kind of big and complicated leaks, but not everything has to be that way. There can be some really fruitful investigations done on the basis of open data. Let me just reflect on three very briefly before I wind up. So Bureau Local is a project from the Bureau of Investigative Journalism that uh, I'm on the board of. Um, and it basically it does the heavy lifting around uh, data sets on behalf of a range of local news partners in the UK. So over 900 members nearly 300 local stories and so on, using different resources. Um, it's broke, broken more than 30 exclusives, including the investigation into local authority finances, which revealed that half of the councils in England planned to cut children's services, that they were selling off public assets and public spaces in order to uh, make up for budget shortfalls. Uh, it's also done a, a huge amount of work on homelessness in Britain, which is now uh, uh, growing uh, exponentially. So. Basically, they have the expertise, the data expertise centrally, some of the investigative expertise centrally, and they partner with local news outlets, and they provide the local um, uh, uh, lens through which to look at it, a bit of local reporting to put onto it. 
So, uh, and all done on open data. Um, but it's having some real uh, impact in the UK. Another example, a global example, some of you will have seen this one, um, where BBC Africa uh, investigated the killing of women and children in Cameroon, and they used open source technology and human networks in Africa, uh, combined with tools like Google Earth and so on, to pinpoint where the atrocity took place and to um, uh, finger the probable culprits. Um, uh, and the, uh, the Cameroon government was forced to admit uh, in the end that this had taken place. And uh, as an initiative, it was basically on Twitter, but then there was a video that followed up uh, as won a number of awards. What's interesting about that is, again, it was all open data, open source, open tools, but it was top down. It was an organization like the BBC saying, who can we find to help us? Who can we reach out to? What networks can we reach out to uh, in order to help us to deliver this? Um, some of you will know Bellingcat, and that's the opposite. Again, it's open source investigation, um, uh, but uh, it investigates a whole wide range of, of issues from what's happening in Ukraine to um, uh, Mexican drug lords and many other things, but that's bottom up. So there's a group uh, of uh, people who are not professional journalists. They now work with professional journalists. They bring their particular analytical expertise and surface stories that should move up into the mainstream agenda. So it's going in the opposite direction. The point I'm making about these is these are all very good and interesting examples of investigative journalism using open data rather than relying on big uh, secret leaks. So it's not all about secret leaks. So just to pull it together then, uh, finally, um, <coughs> collaboration has been a part of journalism's history since the 19th century, but the technology that we have now uh, is redefining communications and means there are a lot of new opportunities for this kind of cooperation. Uh, news organisations have got to raise their sites beyond national boundaries, raise their skills to engage with uh, highly developed systems of financial technology or internet-enabled crime. Um, and the overall concept of public accountability uh, cannot and should not be narrowly confined by mere geographic or organisational boundaries. And importantly, journalists can no longer go it alone for all the reasons we've been discussing today. International accountability is also an issue for lawyers, economists, politicians, lobbyists, scientists, healthcare professionals, academics, accountancy, business, finance professionals, and many more. And journalism has to open up and bring that expertise into their hunt for stories if they're actually going to land more than the odd individual case that we talked about earlier. Um, finally, uh, the argument that I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, we have to concentrate on the social value of investigative journalism, and particularly in a pan-national environment. Governments and foundations understand, in theory, the value of open data and recognise the corrosive effect of corruption and crime on social, economic and political well-being, and yet the link between free information, public accountability and serious journalism has to continually be made. Um, the American academic James Hamilton said in his book Democracy's Detectives, that one dollar spent in investigative journalism can yield hundreds of dollars in social benefits. He asserted that. I'm not quite sure how he calculated it, but I would love to find out, because it's a very useful statistic if it's true. Uh, but we need to find a few more to back that up and in order to make the case. But open collaboration uh, uh, across news organisations, across countries, across specialisms, is a way that I think we can make progress through some of these challenges that we currently face. I'll just finish on this quote from Frederick Obermeyer from Süddeutsche Zeitung, who helped break um, uh, the Panama Papers. I learned the more you share, the more radically you share, the better the investigation. Uh, without sharing, these projects are not possible. And the more transparent the projects are, the better it is. Everybody benefited. That's it. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. We do have time for one or two questions, right? If, are there any questions or are you totally exhausted after a long day? Yeah. Hard day <laughs> I wouldn't blame you. No, I've hammered them into the ground. Right? Well, I see two hands. Let's have those two people ask sure. questions and then wrap it up. Yes, hello, Maria Kunderun from Cardiff University as well. Um, uh, my question is more, you, you were uh, listing up uh, the benefit of uh, collaborations. If you can say a couple of words about what is the disadvantages. Well, not everything uh, is suited to collaboration and not every collaboration works. 
Um, so, you know, collaboration is a tool, uh, and there will be projects where it isn't appropriate. But, you know, I think you have to analyse what it is you're trying to achieve. Do you need to bring extra skills in? Are there benefits to being networked across organisations? The kind of strengths that I mentioned before, in which case it may be worth trying. But there will be other kinds of issues, other kinds of investigation stories where actually a more traditional route is, is either more appropriate or, pro or even easier to deliver. So it's, it's wrong to say every investigation now needs to be collaborative, uh, uh, but we are able to collaborate in a way we've never been able to before, and if we do so, it does mitigate a lot of the challenges that we're facing. I, I just wanted to add to what you're saying. Is this on? Oh, yeah. That um, when the New York Times finally did their 20,000-word um, piece on Trump tax avoidance and it didn't get much attention, they were criticized for not sharing. Our media critic said they should have cut it up into pieces and given little bits of it to the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post because then it would have had more impact and everyone would have felt more inv invested. So that really reinforces your cool. point about how this, the thinking has changed so quickly. Yeah. I think it's due to financial desperation, among other reasons, but anyway. It's definitely part of it, yeah. yeah. Hi, first of all, I would like to thank for this very nice day and uh, very interesting, all, the whole uh, conference. And then I would like to ask, uh, when you were talking about uh, uh, progress uh, linked to uh, information, uh, there was uh, this statistic 90% of the world's population uh, live in countries with mm -hmm. uh, uh, RTI laws. And uh, uh, what I'm thinking is that uh, either the statistic must be wrong or these laws are not implemented well enough because I'm just thinking my first thought is China. Mm. Uh, well, that may not be one of the 90, but um, yeah. no, you're right. The point I was making is that even those countries who, no, who so they have. No, no, I it's think it was 90, 90 countries. of the world's Hang population, on. it said, lived in no, countries. No, no, I don't think that's quite right. Hang on, let me go back and find it. I'm sorry. It's, oh, 90% of the world's population. Yes, okay, you're right. Sorry, I thought it was 90. So um, uh, the point is that, what the point I was making is that that's a great headline. Uh, it comes from Article 19. I'm, you know, I, they, it's their figure. I've no, they're a very reputable organisation. I've no reason to suppose that's not uh, the case. But even those countries who say they have right to know um, legislation don't necessarily implement it. And if you live in one of those countries, actually trying to find the information you want um, may be as uh, hard or harder than if they didn't have the legislation. So th this is the point. There's a, there's a headline crust of good intent or stated intent but the picture underneath that can be very, very different. Hello? Uh, <coughs> yeah. yeah. Let me also remind you that afterwards we'll have three more sessions, parallel sessions, and you are most welcome to join them. And we do have some really interesting papers to be presented. The Associate Professors of Journalism, Birgitte Chusfon and Maria Konovlund, in, in um, classroom one up on the third floor. Um, in classroom two, we will have senior researcher Aslak Orde and Professor Emeritus Helge Rönning. We'll have Kasper Wagle also presenting um, papers. And then at the end, we do have two excellent professors of accounting coming all the way from Newcastle and Sheffield. So don't miss that either. But before, we need to thank Richard Sandbrook for coming from Cardiff. So thank you very much. This was excellent. Thank you. We do have flowers for you. <laughs> <laughs>